Donc bonjour à tous, euh, merci à ceux qui se joignent à nous pour cette deuxième journée, malgré les petites difficultés qu'il y a eu hier en termes de climat et de problèmes techniques. Donc merci d'être revenu pour cette deuxième journée. Et bienvenue à ceux qui se joignent à nous pour euh, ce deuxième jour. Euh, avant de commencer cette troisième session, j'aurais juste voulu faire deux petits mots pour euh, rappeler l'objectif de, de cet atelier qui est organisé conjointement par les Amis de la Terre, le CIRAD et le GRET, euh, dans, avec l'objectif de discuter de la capacité du mécanisme RED+, sous ses différents, différentes formes et déclinaisons, à s'attaquer aux causes profondes de la déforestation. Donc, je voudrais ajouter que pour le GRET et le CIRAD, cet atelier vient clore un projet de deux ans, qui était financé par le ministère de l'Écologie et du Développement Durable et du Transport, dans le cadre d'un programme repère qui visait à renforcer les liens entre société civile et recherche. Donc nous avions un, un projet, enfin on a encore un projet qui s'appelle Red Plus et PSE, payé pour l'environnement entre marchandisation et développement durable, et qui avait pour objectif principal de construire une réflexion critique sur ces deux mécanismes Red Plus et PSE, et leur capacité à répondre aux enjeux de développement durable et de protection de l'environnement. On avait notamment fixé comme objectif, dans le cadre de ce projet, d'élaborer des recommandations à l'égard de, des pouvoirs publics et de la société civile. Donc, on vous l'avait signalé hier matin, ça fait partie des objectifs de cet atelier pour nous, d'arriver à formuler des, des recommandations. Donc comme souvent c'est un exercice un peu périlleux au cours d'un atelier d'arriver à formuler tous ensemble des, des recommandations, on a commencé à travailler là-dessus avec les Amis de la Terre, le CIRAD et le GRET. Et pendant toute la phase de préparation de l'atelier, on a construit ces propositions de recommandations. Donc on est arrivé à une série de 10 propositions qui vous ont été distribuées ce matin. Donc même si c'est un format euh, un peu dit commandement, euh, c'est pas gravé dans le marbre. Et euh, l'idée c'est bien, euh, voilà, bien des propositions qu'on a préparées pour pouvoir euh, discuter avec vous, vous laisser un peu de temps ce matin euh, d'y réfléchir. Et l'idée c'est de les mettre en, en discussion euh, cet après-midi au cours de la deuxième session. Donc voilà, elles en sont distribuées maintenant, mais l'idée c'est bien de discuter de ça cet après-midi. Pardon, et de pouvoir les retravailler en fonction de ce qui se sera dit cet après-midi. Euh, pour le cas où tout le monde n'aurait pas le temps d'exprimer de, ses idées sur ses recommandations, vous pourrez aussi peut-être faire des propositions écrites et on essaiera de les intégrer. Euh, donc, je fais un rapide petit point sur ce qui s'est dit euh, hier matin, sans avoir euh, la prétention de faire une synthèse, c'est juste pour rappeler les sujets qui ont été abordés. Donc on a une première session qui visait un peu à poser le contexte de la déforestation et du RED+. Donc on a eu euh, quelques chiffres sur les grandes tendances d'évolution de la déforestation, qui montrent que globalement ça peut diminuer un peu dans certains endroits, mais ça reste stable avec des chiffres assez élevés. Je vous montre aussi avec euh, quelles précautions il faut manier tous ces chiffres qui sont donnés sur les estimations à l'échelle internationale. Ça a permis d'aborder les différentes causes de la déforestation avec un focus spécial sur la biomasse énergie. On a eu un bref historique de la construction du mécanisme RED+, et surtout un rappel des différents débats et questionnements qui, ont, qui tournent autour de ce mécanisme. Et enfin, une cartographie des projets RED, qui montrait qu'il y avait plus de 325 projets en cours, dont un certain nombre, pas forcément tous, mais un certain nombre, qui posaient des vraies questions sur leur, sur leur validité. La deuxième session avait pour objectif de discuter des réalités des politiques de lutte contre la déforestation et du rôle de Red Plus dans ces politiques, avec plusieurs études de cas dans le bassin du Congo, au Brésil, en Indonésie. Donc là, Donc il y a eu pas mal de débats autour de, de cette deuxième session. Je ne vais pas me risquer à, les, à essayer de, de les synthétiser tous. Par contre, euh, bah, j'aimerais souligner qu'un certain nombre de points qui ont été abordés euh, correspondent avec des recommandations qu'on a déjà préparées en amont du débat. Donc c'est plutôt intéressant de voir que, que ça allait dans ce sens. Euh, je ne sais pas si enfin, bon, je, je vais vite, vite rapidement peut-être les, les aborder. Donc euh, un des éléments importants, c'était la nécessaire mise en cohérence des différentes politiques publiques qui affectent les forêts que ce soit à l'échelle nationale, donc on a vu les problèmes d'incohérence entre politiques au niveau du, des différents ministères, 
euh, que ce soit en Indonésie ou au Cameroun, ça a été assez euh, souligné par les intervenants. Mais aussi au niveau des mécanismes internationaux, il y a eu toute une discussion sur la possible et nécessaire articulation entre FLECT et RED+. Euh, on a aussi discuté de, du rôle des niveaux de consommation européens dans la déforestation des pays du Sud, que ça a un impact et que le mécanisme RED+, de, ne doit pas euh, venir euh, servir d'alibi pour permettre de poursuivre ces, consommations, ces niveaux de consommation. On a également abordé le besoin préalable de clarifier les droits fonciers, en reconnaissant notamment les droits des populations sur les espaces et les ressources qu'ils utilisent. On a également insisté sur le fait qu'il fallait renoncer à l'idée que Red Plus pouvait être une solution rapide et peu coûteuse pour lutter contre les émissions de carbone. Voilà, bon, on a aussi souligné, le, et ça c'est peut-être pas suffisamment dans nos recommandations, sur le rôle de la société civile au nord comme au sud, pour, euh, bah, à la fois comme acteur de, de la lutte contre les émissions de carbone, mais aussi comme euh, détenteur euh, au niveau de droits qui doivent euh, s'assurer que ces droits sont, sont préservés. Voilà, alors maintenant on va pouvoir passer à la troisième session. Donc l'idée c'était de revenir un peu plus spécifiquement sur le RED+, comme mécanisme financé par le marché des carbone, du carbone. On a insisté hier sur le fait que le RED+, n'était pas un mécanisme dont l'architecture était déjà défini et arrêté. Il y a plusieurs questionnements qui subsistent, notamment sur les sources de financement. Est-ce que ça doit être par le marché du carbone Est-ce que ça doit être par les fonds euh, Est-ce que ça doit être une, une architecture avec des projets mis en œuvre au niveau euh, de projets, au niveau mis en œuvre au niveau national Donc là, l'idée de cette troisième session, c'est de poser la question du RED+, s'il est financé par le marché du carbone, quels impacts potentiels cela peut avoir sur le climat, bien sûr mais aussi sur les communautés et la biodiversité. Et quelles alternatives peuvent exister à ce modèle de, de RED+, financé par le marché du carbone Donc on aura quatre présentations d'une heure trente. Donc là, je demanderai aux intervenants, comme hier, de respecter les, les 15-20 minutes, 15 à 20 minutes par euh, présentation pour garder un peu de temps pour poser les questions d'éclaircissement et surtout pour, euh, après la pause, de 11h30 à 12h30, avoir le temps d'avoir vraiment un, un débat avec la salle sur, euh, sur ces différentes présentations et quelques questions qu'on a préparées. Euh, donc, donc, je vais maintenant donner la parole à Yuta Kiel, qui est biologiste de formation, qui travaille actuellement pour le World Forest Movement, un réseau international qui appuie les communautés, notamment face aux grands projets de plantation qui est aussi une activiste basée à Berlin, qui analyse les questions de monétarisation de la nature, et qui va nous présenter ce matin l'analyse d'un projet RED+, au Mozambique. Merci Aurélie, et je, je vais faire la présentation en, en anglais pour faciliter la compréhension. Bon, euh... Oui. Um, il y a plus de détails, uh, oops, um, more details about the case study that I will be talking about um, are also on the on the table in this little um, publication co-published by Fern and Amid um, Um I should also, to avoid confusion, say that why is somebody from the Rain World Rainforest Movement presenting a study from Fern and Amid Latter? Until last year, December, I worked with Fern, and as part of my work at Fern, I um, was involved in the in the research for this case study. So that's um, why I'm sitting here uh, presenting uh, the case study. I want to really talk very little about the details of the project because a lot of the detail is in here, but reflect together with you about what I have taken, the lessons that I take from looking at this project and how the lessons or the, the lessons that I have taken from this particular project very much are in line with a lot of the other projects that I have looked at over the last years. I have followed the carbon market and how it links to forests for about 14 years now. I have looked at more or less 20 projects Um, either directly or spoken with people who are directly affected by or involved in the project and have 
done fairly detailed research on maybe another 10 projects. So if we say that there's around 300 projects around, I think I've had either first-hand experience or information first-hand of about 10% of those. Um, and there's a lot of similarities between them, which is what I would like to talk about. So the Nambita pilot project, where is it, who is involved? Um, it's located in the central part of Mozambique, um, far away from the coal mines, um, far away from the plantation areas, um, in a region uh, where you find several, and particularly one big national park, and uh, a very dense, uh, or high population density. The project was managed by a UK company called EnviroTrade. Um, there were a number of research institutions and consultancies involved in the implementation of the project um, during the first five years. Those first five years were also financed by a grant from the European Commission. At the time, that was the Tropical Forest Budget Line, later on called the Environment in Developing Countries Budget Line. Uh, the project received, received about a million and a half euros from uh, the Environment in Developing Countries Budget Line. And after that grant finished, the project continued, um, sold carbon credits for about a million and a half, and during that time had expenses to cover of about three million. So from the perspective of an investment, not very good investment, um, because the difference was covered by the generosity of the company that initiated the project. Um, so return on investment was uh, a bit negative. What did the project set out to do? Um, they were very ambitious and I would say probably really tried to support the community in a very challenging and very impoverished environment. They wanted, they made cash payments to local farmers in very small communities um, where pressure on forests was very high because it was still an area of high migration because after the, this, uh, the internal conflicts, people were still either moving back or moving to that area. Um, they wanted, with those cash payments, they wanted to achieve the conservation of a collectively owned forest. They wanted to set up new small plantations in an agroforestry scheme to take away the pressure from the remaining jointly communally owned forests where a lot of the char trees were cut for charcoal. They developed a series of micro-businesses um, they wanted to demonstrate with this project the effectiveness of the carbon market as a way to finance community development projects. And they wanted to learn from the implementation of the project, learn about how to design a project well, how to implement a project well, how to measure and how to monitor the carbon and um, biodiversity and social aspects of the project. The project proposal was also very clear that they committed to putting as much effort into the monitoring, the measuring and the analysis as they would put in the implementation of the actual project. Because it was to be a pilot project and if you want to have a pilot project you have to have meaningful documentation, otherwise where is the pilot, where is the learning that you can, what you can take. They also committed to a participatory approach to methodology development and um, including the community in the design of the project. And they committed to promoting rural developments um, and generate verifiable emission reductions that could be um, offered to the international community. These are um, the commitments that the project made in its grant proposal to the European Union and um, which it reiterated when they were selling carbon credits on the international market. What did the project do? It did a lot. It signed contracts with individual farmers, um, about 1,800 of them, um, and one farmer could sign more than one contract, so there are many more contracts than there are farmers or families involved. There were payments to the community 
to help protect the forest area that was jointly owned. Um, they supported a lot of micro-businesses in the community. Um, they supported also the, the development and the marketing of non-timber forest products, bees, um, produ um, artisanal products, all the kind of things that uh, usually are on the list. They also, they didn't create a local system to monitor um, carbon sequestration or avoided deforestation, and I'll come back to that. They did set up community buildings, there is a new housing, there are new um, offices, and some of that was paid from the carbon credits. They also probably built some, or can have a credible claim to building some regional capacity because of the workshops that were held, because of the discussions that were held within Mozambique. Um, the capacity built at the local level uh, was similar to the capacity that Mathieu talked about yesterday when he um, shared his, his, his uh, story about the response of communities to what is carbon. Uh, you know, carbon is not the piece of paper that we use to, to double, uh, to, to copy, but uh, that level of understanding was also achieved here, but not more. When people were asked about what they knew about carbon markets and the carbon measuring that happened for the project, they said, oh, that's something that the technicians do. With these really well-intended objectives, people who probably had the right motivations, who had a big grant to start with, and who did a lot, why did the project still go so wrong? Why, after 10 years and a million worth of carbon credits sold, do they still not even have a credible baseline? So a million worth of, more than a million worth of carbon credits have been sold. And the baseline for the project was built on two data points to establish historical deforestation rates. The inventory, the carbon baseline, was done by a study of about seven and a half, let's say 10 to be generous, hectares of a more than 90,000 hectare project and an inventory that was meant to do a species list and not establish carbon content of the project area. Again, this is not unusual. In a lot of the other small scale, particularly projects that involve communities, we see the same thing. Um, and the project did not even consider in its documents the likelihood of leakage, of community members using timber for charcoaling, just moving to the neighboring province and continuing um, the charcoal production there. There was no mention of the risk of just displacing the, the activities that led to deforestation to another region, not considered in the project documentation. And I could list a lot more technical um, problems, a lot of more technical things that went wrong. Some of them are mentioned in here and there's about 300 pages of external assessments done on the project um, which focused on those technical aspects and that is why I would like to also highlight maybe less the technical but more the social um, aspects um, that went wrong as well. Many farmers today after 10 years and the project payments running out see the tree planting that they committed to as a liability. It costs the money to maintain, but they get nothing in return. And worse than get nothing in return, they have to spend the time that otherwise they would be able to spend on growing food. Of the many micro-projects, the sawmill doesn't work anymore because the saw is broken and there is no money to repair it. The bakery that opened isn't baking any bread anymore because the oven doesn't work and there is no money to repair it and no technical expertise to do so. The company still says that there are many people um, owning beehives. The research that we um, conducted um, in the region was that there was ever only one farmer that had bees. The bees died in the first summer and he never bothered to, repair them, uh, to replace them. And from a gender perspective, the project also had a lot of negative impacts because it doubled 
the workload, or at least increased, if not doubled, the workload for women, who now had not only to tend to the new trees that were planted, but also do both their share of the food production, but also the share of the men in the food production, because the men were the ones who were getting, during the first five years, the paid jobs in the sawmill and for the um, restoring of the forest. And I think what I learned from this and seeing that this is a pattern that is repeated in many other projects, not just carbon projects, I should reiterate here. This is a list of experiences that many of you who have worked on development cooperation will remember. Many of you who are on the receiving end of, of um, European aid will remember going to communities and hearing things like this. So this is not particular to carbon, but carbon exacerbated it because there was a different driver and the focus was on measuring carbon. And I think what is very clear that if there is successful um, implementation of projects, there has to be a commitment to start from the local, to understand what the local drivers are and to build projects from a local level up. Um, and I want to come back to that, but before that I want to look at another thing that went wrong. The project also did what most forest carbon projects do, it sought certification. Um, in this case, for the, from the climate and biodiversity, a uh, climate community and biodiversity association, the CCBA, and the Rainforest Alliance, known um, to some of you from FSC certification, was the certifier. And what is striking is that they discovered a lot of the technical problems. And there were many to discover. I've only taken out two. I could have filled my whole presentation with comments from the certification report, but I don't. So they said, it's not clear how the baseline was determined. You have to sort this out before we can certify. The response from EnviroTrade, we make an agreement in principle that in future we will consider how to deal with that and try to increase our project buffer so it, it, um, it fulfills the requirements. The promise for add a future point commit, uh, committing to review was enough to certify or to tick off that box. The same was with the payment. How were measurements done that there was actually carbon storage happening? Not by looking at the trees, measuring them and doing all of that, not that that gives us numbers, but not even that was done. They looked at the list of carbon payments, 27 payments made, um, 27 payments equals X tons of carbon. That isn't even in compliance with the CCB standard. And again, the response of the project developers was that they will be revising the quantification methods in the future and will put in place measures to conform. The promise for future action was enough for the project to be able to advertise itself as a gold standard CCB certified project. Too bad that the CCB doesn't even have a mechanism to withdraw a certificate. It is obvious that this was not a credible certification process. And I could have taken the project that we heard of yesterday in, in the DRC, the EARA project in, uh, in Mayendombe, and could have pulled out the same uh, points, or similar points. I could have gone to the Wildlife Works project in Kenya and pulled out the same contradictions between the assessment of the certifier, the response of the project developer, and the result, which almost always is a certificate issue, irrespective of the problems found. The problems are described the way on the promise of future betterment. And that brings me back to the title of that slide. Is certification for carbon really quality assurance or, and I use the one of the first phrases that I learned in Portuguese, for the English to see. Um, for the English to see is a very common saying in Portuguese, in Brazil, I should say. It goes back to the time when the English had banned slavery, but slavery was still common practice in Brazil. So when the English um, came to check on their 
um, coffee plantations. The coffee plantation owners made sure that the English did not see the slaves for the day that they were there. And the English wrote, slavery not a problem on the coffee plantation, coffee can be exported. I think the fact that this saying is still one of the first that a foreigner learns in that language tells us something about the reality of law enforcement and the possibilities to circumvent um, requirements and the difficulty that any certifier not very familiar with a local context will face when trying to really do a good job in a, in a context like that. And I think it's worth reflecting. And it is not, even though the saying comes from Brazil, I think if we talk to colleagues in, in DRC, if we talk to colleagues in the Central African Republic, if we talk to colleagues in Cameroon, we would find similar sayings in those places. Um, I will probably be running a little short, so I will skip over some of the fundamental flaws, but just say, of course community members sign contracts. In a, in a situation of extreme poverty, if somebody from the outside comes and offers you money, and you take it. Of course you do. Um, but there is no ownership. You feel no commitment. If somebody from the outside comes and says, here's a project, do you want to participate, yes or no? Of course my answer is yes. If that means I can feed children, I can put a tin roof on the house, and maybe there is a, is a school building in the, in the village after that. How can we think that the answer would be any different than yes? But is that participation? Is that something that really means the project addresses the local drivers and the local problems? Is there a real and meaningful engagement with the community to understand their analysis of what is driving deforestation locally. And I think in those circumstances, to assume that a payment for about seven or even 10 years will lead to a permanent behavioral change is ludicrous. It's an assumption that is wrong and must not be made because it's so obvious that it will not work. Um, Save for implementation of, and monitoring, they tried hard. But if the community has no ownership of the project, everybody who has been involved in, in development projects knows that if you try to do a project against the will of a community or with half-hearted will of a community, good luck, it is hard. And it will fail. We see the, the pumps of water that don't work. We, I, mean, I don't have to tell you all the examples. Um, carbon, question, uh, carbon calculations. I, um, two data points for a historical um, baseline. Accepted and signed off by a research institution, the University of Edinburgh, who had at least four PhD students involved in that project. I mean, what, what does that do also to scientific credibility? I, it, it still beggars my belief um, that, that a project like that passed so many credible institutions without challenge. And it also failed because there was no consideration of the local circumstances um, and the drivers. So there is no change in the structural drivers of deforestation. None. There is none. I think we shouldn't be surprised if we continue to look at red or reducing emissions from deforestation as something where somebody from the outside without roots in the community comes and says, here's what you have to do. When we, in our context, are still not possible to even have a public discussion about how we intend to, to get rid of fossil fuels in our economies, I think we will not move very far. Safeguards and ethic, and then I come to the last two slides. I think the fact that there is talk about safeguards 
and that there is talk about the need for free, prior, and informed consent in red, for me is a clear signal that the project, that the approach starts at the wrong end of the stick. If you started at the right end of the stick, you wouldn't need ethnic. What does the community say about the project? The name Nambita has traveled around the world, but what is there to see? What have we as community gained? Not much. The families that already had a lot of um, plots, they made a lot of money during those 10 years, but for the rest of the community, the benefits are small. And some don't even care anymore about the trees because the payment is too small. Just a case of really bad implementation. Yes, it definitely was really bad implementation, but I've just listed here the projects that most of them I've been to either personally or I've had direct contact with people. And I could make similar presentations. I could have taken any one of those projects and come to almost the same conclusions that I've gone through for Nambita. And it's not because motivations are bad. It's because the mechanism doesn't really allow you to do a project that is beneficial for the climate and beneficial for the community. If you think there is one, tell people where to go. I've asked many people, tell me where to go to find a project that works for the climate and for the community. Wherever people have said to go, we found major problems when we talked to the communities. I'll skip over those two and I'll finish with the question of that left there. Is it bad project implementation or is the finding of project after project that doesn't work, a sign of a flawed approach. And I, I'm reading, so I cut this off, that's too bad. I'm reading a, a book uh, by the US social critic from uh, the early 40s era, Upton Sinclair, who looked at the early stages of oil development in Texas um, at the 1700s and 80s, 90s. And he was talking about the misery, and he said, it is very difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding. And I think we can expand that and replace man to understand as a society to also understand something when our prosperity has depended as much as it has, for those in the North, on the luxury of fossil fuels. It is hard for us to understand that we must not focus only on the 20% of global emissions, but refocus on the 80% of emissions, the fossil fuels. And red projects, we said at the beginning, it's not clear yet how red is defined. The reality is defining red as trading. And as Simon Mark remarked yesterday, what need is there for the level of, of number crunching, if not for trading? And offsets do not reduce emissions. At the very best, they avoid an increase in emissions. As society, if we are intent, if we believe that climate change is an issue, an urgent issue, and if we are intent on making that transition, in an orderly fashion that allows us to maintain society as we know it, the time has gone to talk about offsets because we need to talk about reductions. We really urgently need to talk about reductions and we need to talk about reductions for fossil fuel emissions as well as looking at reductions in the um, for, for, uh, deforestation. If the EU and if we in this room were serious about doing that, we would have a campaign for a change in the common agricultural policy. We would have a campaign for our governments to have public education about the need to reduce our excessive meat consumption. We would have a debate that exposes that the EU, Brazil or Mercosur trade agreement is contrary to the EU policies on climate change because what does the trade agreement say? Mercosur will open up the southern 
the Mercosur market for European service companies, and in return, the EU will open up the market for Brazilian meat imports. What's the main driver of deforestation in Brazil? Production of meat. And with that, I want to, to leave it and say one example of many, many, many to show that red really will not deal and does not deal with the problem. And it is trading for all intents and purposes. J'invite maintenant Marc Brightman. professeur à l'université du Collège de Londres. Il est spécialiste en anthropologie politique et environnementale, notamment sur les peuples autochtones de l'Amazonie. Et il va nous parler ce matin du contexte politique du processus readiness en, au Suriname, avec un focus sur la question des droits fonciers et du free prior informed consent. Voilà. Bonjour. Euh... Merci de m'inviter et euh, je m'excuse d'abord parce que je vais, je vais parler en anglais et en plus je n'ai pas réussi à, à quitter mon habitude de, de, um, universitaire d'écrire de, 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 un texte, j'ai fait une présentation d'un texte, donc ça va, ça, ça va être, je crois que je serai le seul à ce colloque, donc je m'excuse. Hein? On va voir. Um, so, uh, since, since 2009, um, Suriname has been preparing for, for Red Plus. And in, in March 20, uh, 2013, this year, Suriname's Red preparation, Readiness Preparation Proposal, the RPP, um, for Red was approved by the World Bank's Forest Carbon Partnership Facility allowing Suriname to receive 3.8 million US dollars for technical preparations to join the RED mechanism. Um, the RPP has been severely criticized by um, Suriname's indigenous and tribal representatives and by the International Indigenous Rights Advocacy Organization Forest Peoples Program um, for making disingenuous claims about the consultation process and about guarantees to address and protect indigenous and tribal lands tenure. I'm not going to repeat these criticisms which are available online, but instead I want to focus on the political context surrounding red and forest peoples in Suriname. The Surinamese government has a poor record of engaging with indigenous peoples. Although it has signed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it, hasn't, um, it has not signed ILO 169, and it does not recognize special rights for indigenous or tribal peoples in its constitution. There are two categories of, I'll just show you a map of Suriname so you can um, see where I'm talking about. There, there are two um, categories of indigenous and tribal peoples, of forest peoples in Suriname. Indigenous peoples, or Amerindians, and Maroons, descendants of slaves who escaped plantations to settle in forests. There are five principal Amerindian groups and six different Maroon groups. My interlocutors, including local leaders um, and representatives of Amerindian organizations, the VITS and the OIS, um, told me that the government has made no real efforts to inform them about RED, let alone consult them about it. It has organized one workshop um, involving only the legal arm of RED, of, of VITS, sorry, the, um, which is basically a Kalina organization. And the only effective workshop on RED from the Amerindian people's point of view um, was organized by COICA, which is the indigenous people's organization of the Amazon Basin, um, and the Woods Hole Research Center, an American um, NGO. The reasons for the government's poor record emerge in, in conversation with government officials. From their perspective, indigenous and tribal peoples are not ready, as they put it, to manage their own projects. They are not conscious or aware enough. They do not yet have the capacity nor are the Indians um, thought capable of managing their own environment. 
The Director of Conservation International in Suriname, which has long been involved with peoples of the interior, has campaigned in vain for the governments to recognize the indigenous peoples' capacity to manage their own environment. Um, but one of my government interlocutors cited examples of co coastal Kalina and Arawak groups who have started to create their gardens using bulldozers and other heavy equipment in order to clear large enough areas to grow crops for sale in the city markets. This is clearly neither traditional nor sustainable, and he suggested it therefore shows that the Amerindians are not capable of acting responsibly when given the freedom to do so. The government officials also declare frustration because they say sooner or later discussions with indigenous groups always return to the usual refrain, this is ours. In other words, they return to the theme of land rights. Indeed, all of the representatives of forest peoples they interviewed said that the principal issue that must be resolved before anything else is land rights. The theme is especially important in Suriname because it is the only country in South America that has not yet passed any reforms granting land rights to its indigenous peoples. The Saramacan Maroons took Suriname to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights over invasions of their territory in the form of mining concessions and in 2007 obtained a landmark decision. In the case of Saramaca people versus Suriname, it was ruled that most notably the state should recognize the collective land rights of the Saramaca. As the Forest People's Program has noted, this case establishes that there are legal risks for government or investors establishing any kind of development project without the consent of indigenous or tribal peoples, as Amerindian and Maroons legally known, on their land. The legally binding rule of the, AI, of the IAC has not yet been implemented by the Surinamese government. However, the ruling almost certainly contributed to the decision to hold a land rights conference in March 2011 um, between the government and representatives of Amerindian and tribal peoples on the subject of gold mining. During the conference, the Grandman representing the Grandman is the is a, is a Maroon chief um, representing the Maroons announced that before any of the outstanding requests for further mining concessions on Maroon territory um, could be discussed any further, a condition had to be fulfilled. The land rights situation for tribal peoples in Suriname would have to be resolved. The Maroons thus allied themselves with the existing consensus of the Amerindians, greatly strengthening their collective position, because the Maroons are considerably more numerous, more organized, and more highly educated. The President of Suriname quickly announced that a conference on land rights would be held at the end of June 2011. So with regard to RED, um, the BSK, which is the Maroon organization, uh, and VITS, the Amerindian organization, had stated that they hold the same position with regard to RED as, as for mining. There will be no discussion of RED until the land rights issue is considered as, and resolved. The Amerindian and Maroon organizations believe that they have a strong position in the wake of the IAC ruling. Concerning RED, they know that the government's preparation for it depends upon World Bank funding under the Readiness Program. Each participating country in the Readiness Program has to submit its Readiness Preparation Plans, which are supposed to provide for the participation and consent of indigenous and tribal peoples. The matter here, here the matter of free and prior informed consent, FPIC, is of fundamental concern. The indigenous and tribal organizations have continued to object to being excluded from the process of readiness at every stage. In Suriname's draft RPP, funds of around $8 million were requested to implement the consultation and participation plan, and the World Bank questioned the need for such a large budget. In response, the government referred to the needs for translation and interpretation into around 10 different languages um, and to carry out consultations in the interior which would respect customary forms of organization and decision making. The indigenous and tribal organizations objected that the government should have consulted them regarding the drafting of the RPP plan in the first place. So here I think this um, draws attention to a significant problem, in, um, which is the lack of clarity on behalf of the World Bank as to what the requirements for free and prior informed consent are, at what stage they should be implemented, and indeed how and who should fund them. Um, 
In May 2009, um, Vids wrote a letter to the government to complain that in the process so far, no consultations with indigenous peoples have been made at all. Vids um, underlines that um, they are rights holders rather than stakeholders in a pointed criticism of one of the key terms of development jargon, whose neutrality makes all parties affected by a development initiative appear equal. Alternatively, perhaps it, it implies that they stand to gain according to the size of their stake or investment. But this assertion of right refers equally to the right to land, which for the Vids representatives is indissociable from indigenous identity. In Suriname, real consultation, consultation across communities is scarcely possible and rarely achieved. Consultation tends to be monopolized by village leaders, charismatic individuals who cannot claim to be as democratically representative as those who monitor such things for NGOs and international institutions would like them to be. FIDS represents the Surinamese indigenous village leaders, and its stated purpose is to reinforce the authority of these capitains, a name which was given to the officially, officially recognized village chiefs by the colonial regime. Let's take it as an example of the trio, which is the main group that I've worked with, who live in the south of Suriname. Um, in the past, traditional trio village leaders could have been said truly to be able to represent their people, because then trio people literally voted with their feet. A man became a leader by creating a new village and commanding enough respect for his sons and sons-in-law and their respective families to live with him. He thus, by definition, represented the will of the people. However, since the 1950s, more and more trio have come to live in mission stations to enjoy the benefits of a clinic, a church, and air freighted manufactured items. First missionaries, then the state, imposed the maroon system of traditional authority, as it is known, which is a rigidly hierarchical system of village chiefs, called capitaines, and tribal paramount chiefs, called grandman. Today's capitaines have their position for life and benefit from monthly stipends free travel and accommodation in the city, in stark contrast to their forebears who were at the mercy of the group. There is much dissent behind their backs, but today's leaders are allowed to speak on behalf of the group, being uniquely qualified to do so because only they are initiated into the secrets of government machinations and project administration, groomed as they are for this purpose by missionaries, ministers, and, to a lesser extent, NGO workers. The limitations to village leaders' grounds for claiming to represent their groups are further highlighted from a gender perspective. Yozin Alima, acting leader of OIS, the Indigenous Peoples Association, which is a rival indigenous organization to FITS, um, who also represents the Surinamese indigenous peoples in Koika, emphasized the role of women in native communities to me, on the grounds that, because they manage the household, they are more aware of changes that occur in the environment. The director of CI told me independently that during CI's project on awareness of climate change among the trio and Guyana, following serious flooding and droughts in 2006 across Suriname, men showed little awareness of long-term rainfall patterns, whereas women were able to give detailed information about historical changes in rainfall. So I think this highlights the importance of involving women fully and systematically in the process of free and fair informed consent and of developing and implementing participatory monitoring processes. If, um, village leaders are not good at sharing information with the community and they tend to be preoccupied with their individual interests. Until now, however, both land rights negotiations and red consultations um, by NGOs and government, insofar as they have been carried out at all, have tended to concentrate on village leaders who are nearly all men. There is also a problem in the case of more progressive attempts at participatory practice. CI, for example, invites villages to send the representatives of their choice. However, the default position of a village faced with such an invitation is to send either the capitaine or Bustur's Obsdichter, which is a minor and nearly always male local official only targeted local participatory workshops could um, potentially involve women at all. Having said this, 
Few ordinary Amerindians or Maroons object to the emphasis of their leaders on land rights insofar as they are even aware of it. Indigenous and tribal organizations intend to follow the precedent of the Saramaka versus Suriname case in claiming full ownership of um, full rights of ownership of land, implying the rights to subsoil resources, minerals, and forest carbon. Government representatives will not take such claims seriously. Indeed, when I raised them during my interviews, they laughed at the prospect of ceding what they see as the state's sovereign rights. Still, as a negotiating position, the demand of full ownership may prove fruitful, even if it is not granted. The Maroon leaders I spoke to took this strategic view and hinted that they may, may be ready to compromise to reach an agreement. But the Amerindian leaders refuse, um, they drive a much harder bargain and refuse to compromise on the matter of principle that they are the rightful, rightful sovereigns of all of Suriname. The much awaited land rights conference was delayed for several months, but it last took place in October 2011. Vids attached great importance to it and prepared a coup de théâtre. They wrote an opening speech which laid out their position clearly, and which in the run-up to the conference, the FIDS legal team kept secret but spoke of with a mischievous air of anticipation. In the event, reiterating their previously stated position, they demanded the recognition of full Amerindian land rights to their territories, including the subsoil. However, when they made their dramatic presentation at the opening of the conference, President Bautizé immediately reacted by taking on the role of an offended party, claiming that the Vids delegation was not respecting the protocol of the meeting. He declared the conference a failure, summarily ending the meeting before it had even begun. The land rights debate has an oppositional character in Suriname, which is worsened by the fact that the government does not recognize indigenous and tribal people's traditional capacity for land management. The government officially regards Sweden horticulture, um, la culture se brûle, um, as a form of deforestation, and has so far refused to reform the 1954 law on protected areas, which, although it allows traditional subsistence in protected areas, does not allow for indigenous management. All protected areas must be state managed. So, on a ministerial level, the lack of willingness to engage with forest peoples is fueled by prejudice about their level of capability. Yet, it is significant that the trio in Guyana, the Amerindian peoples of the south, a remote region without road transport, have a much better relationship with the government and with major international NGOs than the Kalina and other coastal peoples. There are a number of reasons for this. The Trio and Guyana are widely perceived as real Indians because they have, not been, they have been exposed to the corrupting influence of modernity for only a few decades and they retain their traditional practices in a more obvious and visible way, hunting Swidden horticulture, body painting, feather ornaments, red loincloths, architecture using forest materials, and so on. Coastal Amerindians, although they do still retain many of their traditional practices, in the eyes of government officials have been corrupted because they have sold some of their community forests to timber and, to timber and mining companies, and because some of them use heavy equipment to cut Swidden's. In the words of one official, they're just like us. You don't see naked people anymore. It should go without saying that none of these differences constitute valid distinctions in terms of enlightenment to ancestral property. Uh, entitlement to ancestral property, excuse me. Either from, an, either from a human rights perspective or from an ethnographic perspective. The coastal Indians are in fact in some ways more conscious of their indigenous identity and the value of their traditional knowledge if only because they have more reason to feel that these things are under threat. Nevertheless, it is true that the expansion or intensification of Sweden horticulture and other forms of forest degradation have become a problem where, where populations are denser. Even in the south, there has been some serious forest, localised forest degradation as a result of the creation of larger villages around health posts and schools. The depletion of hunting resources around Kwamala Samutu is currently so bad that the village is breaking up as inhabitants create new villages further away. At least, that is one explanation. The other is that the land rights negotiations have spurred the Trio Grandman to urge his people to populate all of the old Trio villages throughout the territory. The truth appears to be that both factors play a role, and it suggests how, in a completely unintended way, red 
and the accompanying land rights struggle are indirectly leading to at least one phenomenon that redresses an ecological imbalance caused by previous development in interventions. Sweden horticulture raises fundamental questions about knowledge, interpretation and perspective. For according to how it is perceived, forest degradation through traditional activities can be seen as a justification for excluding indigenous and tribal peoples, or as a reason for involving them in Red Plus. The government's attitude to Sweden horticulture ignores the fact this is only a problem under certain circumstances, such as when the population density or concentration is too great, which tends to be the result of poor planning. For these demographic transitions result from the intensive concentration of services in a few locations. Such degradation can also result from the very lack of trust between the government and indigenous and tribal groups when both claim ownership of land and the former implicitly maintains a threat to withhold access in favour of more profitable industrial ventures. As conventional rights-based arguments in favour of full land title um, for indigenous peoples emphasise, such peoples do not merely have an economic stake in the land in terms of natural resources, but are also attached to the land through their traditional identity and spirituality. Yet, even in terms of mere economic incentive, the prospect of Red Plus ought perhaps to lend assurance to sceptical governments because of its potential to act as a further rational incentive for forest conservation. But very few urban Surinamese, such as government officials, perceive Amerindians as rational economic actors anyway. Scientists, including conservation NGO representatives, are interested in environmental goals. Those in power are primarily interested in attracting international funding for development and for greasing the wheels of government itself. In a recent um, ODI, Overseas Development in, um, Institute publication, Melamed, Scott and Mitchell identified a tension between development policy, which emphasises moral standards concerned with individual well-being, and environmental policy based on scientific knowledge about how changes are likely to impact on the global climate or other systems. This may indicate how far international policy is from local or even national realities. In Suriname, quest, um, red has become a question of social justice, caught up as it is in the issue of land rights. In these terms, the environmental issue is of state recognition of indigenous capacities in order to preserve the conditions for individual well-being. Red appears as a development mechanism which seems to imply threats to these conditions. Understood in these terms, it represents a set of misunderstandings which seem unlikely to work for forest peoples except perhaps in the most unexpected of ways. Thank you. Déjà un peu dépassé le temps imparti, mais peut-être on peut quand même prendre une ou deux questions de clarification, mais vraiment des questions de clarification, soit sur la présentation de Marc ou celle de Lita.